Lewis all right well good morning people good morning <laughs> good evening everybody good evening everyone can you guys hear me okay yes excellent excellent all right well my name is mark minerich i'm the president of the astronomy section of the rochester academy of sciences our april meeting welcome everyone glad to have you guys here today we are probably about 20 or so people in here. I have another uh, 13 people online. So welcome everyone. Glad to have you guys with us today for our uh, April meeting. Folks online, you can see my presentation okay? Yep. You can yep. see it. Excellent. All right. I know I've sometimes I've started meetings without my presentation. I just start rambling. So let me, uh, let me get my cursor over here so I can get things started. All right. So. Um, so welcome everybody. I have a few announcements for uh, what's coming up in the next couple of months. And then uh, we have four feature talks today, all gonna come at you pretty quickly from four uh, graduate students right here at uh, RIT. And I'll introduce them as they come. That's uh, Sadie Coffin, Jamie, we call you. Thanks, Jamie, you make it a lot easier that way. Jamie, uh, Ben Vaughn and Sophia have talks. And yes, and we will, uh, we will get to their talks after our announcements and uh, pretty, pretty quick talks and we'll have questions for each of those after those. So welcome everybody and welcome RIT guys. Glad to have you guys join us tonight. Fantastic to hear what you guys are up to. Um, so is there anybody, this is the first time they've been to an RIT meeting or excuse me, a uh, astronomy section meeting outside of you guys that are here to speak with us tonight. We're glad, glad you're here. Anybody else online? First time you're with us? My first time. First time, Bert, and you're part yep. of the Buffalo Astronomical Association? No, I'm down in the Binghamton area. So. Oh, you're in Binghamton. Yeah, but I, uh, I I travel a lot to Rochester for uh, family, and I recruit at RIT, actually. Oh, excellent. Excellent. You guys hear that okay? Yeah, they're glad, glad, that, glad to have you join us. Well, thanks for joining us. Anybody else? First time you're joining us? Um, for those of you um, not in the know, I know that I've invited folks from the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society that's over near the Oneida area, and then the uh, the folks from the Buffalo Astronomical Association. Some of those folks are out tonight. I can see a couple of faces I recognize from the Buffalo group. So glad to have you guys with us. Thanks for coming. And okay, I have to stop messing around with my uh, my mouse. So anybody do any observing recently? They want to talk about. Dr. Richmond. I'm teaching a course this semester called Observational Astronomy, where the students are supposed to go out and observe things. And for the first six weeks, I taught them, here's what you would do. And it's all set up for after the spring break, we're going to go and look at things. So it hasn't been doing so. Six, six <laughs> weeks of observational astronomy without any observing. That's hard to do. Three, it's been tough. Three half decent nights. Uh, and so maybe they'll get enough data. But that's it's a struggle. It's a struggle. Do you guys hear that online? You guys hearing that? Okay. So yeah, Dr. Richmond's teaching an observational astronomy course and has had virtually no nights other than a couple of parcels. It's the same three days ago, right? I just tried my first night of astrophotography. Yes. It was so, so worked out okay. It was the first clear night in quite a while. And I happened to be arriving at the There you go. 1037. Yes. So it worked out okay, but I'm just progressing. Yes. It is fun to do. It, it, it can be so much fun that it can absorb you. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, my comment on it is normally, in, uh, if you're part of the astronomy section email group, it's a Google group, you get updates from members that are taking images. And I've got no image. I usually take an image. And I put it up here. That's the only image I have. It was from a nice sunny day. Bob McGovern was out at the site using our telescope and has uh, images, a couple images of sunspots. We're finally getting some sunspot activity. So there's there's some astronomy during the daytime anyway, if you, uh, you're you into doing some solar stuff, but that's it. We've had some sunny days, but not many clear nights. You know. Well, we were supposed to do a, a Messier marathon tomorrow night, but that doesn't look like that's gonna happen. Uh, and we're also waiting for that, that clear night to do supernova imaging. I actually had a nice night, but I got uh, I got bumped by U of R students actually doing 
work. So I guess I got to let the students do their work on the Mies telescope. So, but we'll find a night. There are some supernova out there to image. There was some that were really nice and early in the evening too, or at least one that was really early in the evening too. So we will get around to it eventually. But uh, so I'll keep I'll keep this at the front burner or the back burner as it will for uh, a supernova imaging session. You guys can see how that's all done, setting up the scope, doing the imaging, um, calibrating the image, that kind of stuff. It's kind of cool to see how that all works. Fun thing to do. All right, so our April meetings tonight, I forgot to take the slide out. We do have a board meeting uh, on Wednesday. It's a virtual meeting. Any member is welcome to attend the board meeting. Shoot me an email. My contact information is on the newsletter if you want to attend the board meeting. Glad to have anybody attend the board meeting. Uh, so please do let me know if you want to attend. But we're going to meet at 7 o'clock. Typically, two hours is our meeting, uh, although the last couple have been short, about an hour and a half. Glad to have you join us. Discussing the things that we're doing, things you want to do, you want to have some input, glad to have your input at our meetings. In May, we will be no longer at RIT. We'll spend the summer doing our events at the Farish Center. And that's great because we can actually do observing after our meetings if it's clear out. So we'll hope for clear skies on those early in the month Friday evenings to do uh, some observing at the Farish Center. So the next one is Friday, May 1st. Is that right? It's the, it's the sixth, I think. I think I got the date wrong in there. And that will be uh, Dave, our annual Dave's Bishop. We get to be the, the first of Dave Bishop's presentations of the annual year in astronomy and review. So we'll see some updates of things he's done in the past. And I'm sure he's got some new stuff for us for the astronomy year. Lots of, the, of new stuff. Lots of new stuff, he says. So I look forward to seeing Dave. It's, a, it's probably one of the most looked forward to <laughs> talks in the uh in our curriculum for the year because there's so much stuff that happens and it's all packed together in uh, in one talk so looking forward to that it'll be may 6th may 6th yeah may 6th i'm sorry i think i put a uh a, an older version of this slide on the uh, this presentation on the on the computer tonight in june we'll uh, we're try to do some stuff with the buffalo astronomy association Astronomical Association, and we'll, we're going to do some cooperative stuff with Buffalo. It's still kind of TV to be determined the things we're going to do, but uh, we're going to show the Buffalo people our site. We're actually going to get, I'm actually going to be getting together with them talking about our observatories because they're going to be building a new observatory and uh, they're going to want some input from us on what we thought, felt we did right, what we felt we did wrong, what, what which we, that we've done better, that kind of thing to help them with their plans for their new site. And uh, so we look forward to getting together with the Buffalo group to do that. So we look forward to seeing you guys there. All right, and then Bracha Star Fest is in July, July 22nd, 23rd. Um, we still have a to be announced on our speaker. We've had a couple of speakers fall in and out. So we're still working on that, but uh, we do have uh, kind of an ace in the hole. We'll try to pull that out of our out of our uh, pocket in the next month or so. Kenny, you have a question? Okay. I, I got him. Okay. Okay. But that's July 22nd, 23rd. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Rocha Star Fest, it's, uh, it starts on a Friday night. We'll get together, we'll have some snacks, and we'll play some games. We'll play a round of astro music trivia, or we'll play bits of music where you try to guess the name of the artist, the year it was performed, and the song, and you get points for that, and we'll gather in teams. <coughs> we'll do several rounds of that, and the winner gets some astronomical prize, like Milky Way bars, or moon. I like your hair cutting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the follow, and then after that, we'll play some uh, Astro Jeopardy. But we'll also divide it into three teams. We'll play Astro Jeopardy as well. And then the following day is really the event day. We'll have uh, several talks during the course of the day. It starts about noon. We'll do we'll do three three or so talks during the day done by members or professionals or amateurs on uh, a subject of their choice. And then we'll have some activities to do during the day. And we end the day with a barbecue dinner uh, across the street from us at the, the Ionia Fire Department. And uh, our keynote speaker will speak there as well. And we'll try to put that on Zoom uh, as well for those who couldn't attend. So that's our Rocha Star Fest. Glad to uh, have people come to our Rocha Star Fest. All right. 
Yes. So Kenny's asking if there's a reason why we have it at the fire department. And there's two reasons. First of all, we don't have to rent a tent, set it up and have everybody doing all that. The second is they've offered to do it for us at no charge. We have a kitchen that we can prepare the food in and we have seating and a nice dry room in case it rains. We don't have to do anything other than that. We're not standing on dirt. And we're not standing on dirt, according to Frank. And that's 100% right. <laughs> and air conditioning when it was hot and muggy. And air conditioning. Yeah, Thanks, Nick. And air conditioning. Oh, yes. yes. I don't like air conditioning. Uh, uh, you, can, you can stay outside. Kenny doesn't like air conditioning. <laughs> you like, you, do you like the beach or is it the sand that bothers you? I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the last chance. Uh, today was the final day, but I will take, take them if you got them. We're having a contest to design our Rochester Starfest t-shirts. We have, we have several submissions for the Rochester Starfest t-shirts, but I'll, we'll give it the last shout for people interested in the Rochester Starfest, Starfest t-shirt design. We're looking for a design that is basically one color, maybe two, kind of a line art. We don't want to make it too complicated. We want to make it easy to print on a shirt, make it available to everybody uh, at a decent, a reasonable cost for Rochester Starfest. Uh, send me that design. My, like I said, my uh, email is available on the uh, on the newsletter. Uh, it's also available to you. If you got this invitation, my email is the one that that the, that it came from. So uh, glad to uh, take your submissions for that. It does close. I'll take them up till the end of the weekend, and then we're the uh, board of directors will decide on what shirt we will have next Wednesday at our board meeting, and the winner gets free admission to Rochester Starfest, free dinner and a free t-shirt, so can't go wrong. So looking forward to, looking forward to see the, seeing those submissions and looking forward to presenting to you what the winning submission looks like. So last chance on that. Uh, this is it. We uh, are, If you are a member of the astronomy section, your membership expired on December 31st. We kind of give you a grace period all the way till the end of March. Today is April 1st, so this is the last time I'm gonna show you this slide for uh, renewing for 2020. Too. So um, please get your uh, get your membership in if you haven't renewed. That's not many people, but there are a few people that have not renewed yet. So please send the renewal in. And at the same time, if you have our key holder, and I don't think there's many key holders that have not renewed, but uh, if you're a key holder, uh, you need to be current on your membership to retain your key or to get a new key to the site. The site's been rekeyed, so regardless, your key does not work if you have an old key. And if you paid for a key, I actually have keys here tonight. If you paid for a key, come see me. Neil, I have your key, come see me. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I'll, I'll have your key, come see me. Um, and I'll give you your key for, uh, for this year. Or uh, Roger will be at the site on uh, Sunday for the open house. All right, with that, let me start with our uh, RIT grad students. Sadie, are you ready for us? Excellent. So let me present to you Sadie Coffin to do her talk. Let me pull that up here. Just meeting a couple people here. So let me. Uh... This show is here. Yes, that's it. Okay, so let me uh, do that. And uh, that. Okay, that should be you. Great, just, thank you. I just hit your page up right now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right here, yep. up, down. Get you, uh, get up. Or, or you can click the uh, left mouse button. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Sadie. I'm a first year in the RIT astrophysics program here. And what I'm talking about today, I didn't actually work on at RIT. Um, I worked on this last year, the year before I came to RIT. And I'm talking about the expansion of a supernova remnant, of Kepler's supernova remnant. So before I came to RIT, 
I was working on this project at NASA Goddard in Maryland, where I lived before Rochester. And I was working on a very different project than I'm doing now. And can you all hear me well enough? I can take off my mask as well. Um, so before I was working here, I was working on this project with Supernova Remnants. And when I first heard about this project from my advisor, I thought it sounded really cool because before this, I was a physics major in college and there wasn't a lot of astronomy curricular options. You couldn't really do much astrophysics unless you did research outside of classes. So I did a little bit of research and I worked with a professor at the college to do research on quasars, which are these really super distant, really bright, huge, supermassive black hole systems. So they were super different from a supernova remnant. And the images I was working on in that project were, oh, I lost the ability to change slides. The Is it this one right here? Um, yeah, sure. we can the you should be able to now just click that. Okay. Thank you. So here's some of the images I was looking at before um, my project I'm talking about today. These are distant galaxies that were observed with Hubble. Um, so they're um, red quasars in the middle of galaxies. And the only reason that we can see these objects is because of how bright they are. So we were looking at these images, trying to decide if they were mergers or not. So it was just looking at a static photo and trying to say, can we tell whether there's more than one galaxy here or if there's just one galaxy on its own? And that's about as much as we can see with the best instruments that we have of this distance of an object. Um, so that was my project beforehand. And then when I started to work on this project with supernova remnants, it was wildly different that then you could see an object in our own galaxy changing over time by a significant amount. So this is between 2000, 2006 and 2014, Kepler supernova remnant. These are some of the photos that we took um, in with Chandra Space Telescope and we were able to see it actually expanding over time. So Kepler supernova remnant has some cool, interesting properties about it, which is why we decided to study this um, supernova remnant in particular. First of all, it's a historic supernova remnant. So it has a definitive historical record and it's called supernova 1604 because it exploded in 1604. And that's when it was first recorded by Kepler as being seen in the sky as this bright object. Um, but then it was first discovered in 1985. And since then we've been able to take enough measurements of it to see how it's expanding over time. We also know a few other things about it. We know what kind of supernova it is. We know it was the type 1a supernova. Um, we know that it has a really dense surrounding environment around this supernova. So when it first went off, the, the progenitor star probably expelled a lot of really dense materials into the material that the um, supernova remnant is now expanding into. And the cool thing about the supernova remnant, here's some examples, um, is it a supernova remnant just includes all of the material that's been expelled off of the star after it explodes. So here's kind of a really well-known example is the Crab Nebula. This is a supernova remnant that has um, a little pulsar left behind at the middle of it, which you'll hear a lot more about pulsars later in Sophia's talk. Um, but the Tycho supernova remnant is another good example that's really similar to Kepler supernova. So part of the project that we did was motivated by seeing whether Kepler and Tycho were a lot more similar than we thought they were. Um, so sometimes they look a little bit more asymmetric than others, but in general, you would expect them to expand somewhat circularly away unless it's running into some kind of material along the edge. So for the most part, the supernova remnant has a bit of a well-defined edge where you can kind of track how much that's changing over time. So Kepler's supernova remnant is a cool one and it has some interesting features that we want to be able to study over time. For example, it's really similar to Tycho's supernova remnant was one of them that recently there was a study done on Tycho's supernova remnant that found out that that structure was decelerating rapidly as it expanded. So it was, it was slowing down a lot faster than we expected it to be. 
And we thought that might be happening in Kepler as well. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to look at this longer baseline. Another unique thing was that we had this 14 year study that we could do of the supernova remnant, which you don't always have for an object like this in our galaxy. So we could tell whether it was really changing over a reasonable time scale. Um, and lastly, it also has, um, it has different spectral features on the Northern and Southern rims of the remnant. So you can see how the density in the surrounding material affects what we're seeing in um, spectral um, signatures of the remnant. So speaking of our motivations, the main goals of the project were to discover how the, the remnant was expanding. So to be able to look at the change in time from 2000 to 2014 and to measure just exactly how much it was growing and whether it was decelerating between 2000 and 2006 and then 2006 and 2014. Um, so we had data from the Chandra X-ray telescope um, from these three epochs. So we focused on um, doing 2000, 2006 and 2006, 2014, even though we had some more in between, but to get this general trend of how the remnant was changing over time, um, the way that we went about it was a way that previous supernova remnant studies have been done. And we took an image like this of the supernova remnant and I chose these rectangular regions around the edge in green that were where we would focus on to track how much change was happening over time. So for each of these rectangular regions, we would take out a extract a radio profile to see how the pixel values um, were changed, how the counts were falling in which pixel values over the different epochs that we were working with. So for example, we can look at a nice region four, which has a really well-defined edge and see what kind of a um, image we're looking at. So this is kind of what we would be um, looking for in the radio profile from that um, specific rectangular region was to be looking for where the peak in the counts occurred and then mapping out, oops, there we go mapping out how much it shifted over the different epochs. So on this plot on the right, this is one of the radial profiles for region four. The blue curve on the left is the data from the 2000 epoch, the earliest data that we had. And the data in the orange um, on the right side is from 2014. So they're about, the, the two peaks are about 10 pixels apart. And to find out exactly how much they were apart, um, we chose a pixel window and we did a shift. So I fit the 2000 epic data to the 2014 epic data for each one of those regions to see exactly how many pixels it was moving. Um, from the pixels, then the pixels per year, you can translate into more physical measurements. You can find out how many arc seconds is that per year or how many kilometers per second and figure out exactly how fast the shock is moving. So this is an example of one of the well-behaved profiles that we saw, um, but some of them looked worse too. This is one kind of a profile that we found that was um, much harder to work with that we didn't end up moving forward with. So this was a bad example that we would have wanted to change before going forwards. The This time the blue and the orange curves have a very different slope to them. So the clearly in this in this region, um, for this specific rectangular box that we chose, the shape of the curve over time was changing too much for it to be fit to each other. So for this one, we adjusted the region to make sure that it was perpendicular to the edge of the remnant. Um, and that was kind of the key to matching up the, the edges for the different time periods was making sure that the the rectangular regions were perpendicular, were perpendicular to a radial going outwards. All right, so that's a bad example. Um, for the most part, we had really great matching with the fits and we were able to pull out all the proper motion values. So this is taking how many pixels each region had to shift over time and translating it into um, arc seconds instead of pixels to get the proper motion. 
which is just a way to describe the, the radial motion or the outwards expansion of the remnant in that region. So along the bottom here are the numbers of the regions, and we can look at it next to those regions again to remember where they were, that regions about six to nine or seven to 11, kind of the regions right in the middle of the plot are along the southern rim at the bottom of the remnant. Um, and the ones that are towards the edges that have a much lower proper motion are along the northern rim. So there is a general trend that we saw where the northern rim was moving at a lot slower compared to the southern rim, um, which was kind of almost counterintuitive that the, the northern rim appeared a little bit brighter, but the southern rim was on average moving something like three times as fast as the northern rim. Um, so we can translate that into a velocity, which was about 1700 kilometers per second for all of the, the different regions around the sides, which is pretty consistent with what you see for other supernova remnants um, that are expanding. All right, so we can also look at how the proper motion values or the expansion compares from the first epoch that we have to the second epoch. So in the black is 2000 to 2006, that's the first time period that we could see. And then this, the red is 2006 to 2014, that's the second time period. Um, and we wanted to see whether there was something like what we did see in Tycho supernova remnant, which was where all of the black data points were a lot higher than the red data points, and there was a significant decrease in accelerations that the around the remnant it was decelerating rapidly. But here in Kepler, we don't see as much of that effect. We just see that the black and the red overlap for almost all the regions. For about 12 out of the 16 regions that we looked at, there's not a statistically significant decrease in the velocity. Um, but there could be a hint of deceleration in a couple of them. Um, in regions eight and nine, kind of towards the middle of the plot, because they're located spatially right next to each other, there could be some kind of deceleration happening there that's not happening at others. And there's a statistically significant drop in the velocity for both of them. And region eight is actually also a region where the shock velocity is substantially lower. So the outgoing blast could be encountering some kind of a localized um, dense clump of material here where those two regions are, which is right along the Southern Rim at the bottom. So other than those two, we generally don't see a big drop in acceleration like we did in the other remnants. It seems like we can rule out the possibility that there is a large cavity wall that we saw in Tycho that the remnant is expanding into. So our general conclusion is that there is no evidence for a major deceleration like we saw in Tycho and that it seems like Kepler is running into a bunch of material outside of it that's roughly constant in density. The most logical explanation for the density is that the forward shock from the supernova is encountering the, um, a, the circumstellar medium that's produced by the progenitor star, that it's encountering clumps of material that were produced by the star that first exploded and produced the supernova remnant. But we did see in, there have been other studies done with in the infrared with Spitzer Space Telescope that found post-shock densities something like 10 to the negative 20th cubic centimeters along the bright northern rim. And along the south, it was an order of magnitude lower than that. So there's been some other evidence that there is some kind of a density gradient across, across the remnant, or at least across the circumstellar medium around the remnant. So that kind of a density gradient could help us explain why we're seeing these varying velocities around the edges that aren't all completely consistent with each other. So the final kind of exciting conclusion to this work is that my first, first author paper was published on this project that we did earlier in the year. Uh, I was working on this a couple of years ago. And then after I came to Rochester, my advisor helped me finish it up while I was doing grad work. And so we finally got that submitted and published and it's up on APJ on archive now. Congratulations. Thank That's you. Awesome. Questions for Katie? 
Yes, that's a great question. We can, I'm pretty sure we didn't work with any of the spectral data from um, from Kepler, at least on this, but it's been done for other supernova remnants like it. That I have two questions. One is, uh, what do you mean by radio profile exactly? And the second question is, you said that the northern part of the supernova remnant is in the uh, due to thermal uh, infrared, I presume. Repeat the question. In the southern, in the southern is due to cyclone. Cyclotron yes. indicates magnetic fields. So what, what does that all mean? So the question is. So the first question was about, can you repeat your first question again? Say radio profile. Okay, the first question is about the radial profile. And the second question is about um, the different types of emissions seen in the Northern Rim and the Southern Rim, yeah. is that correct? So first of all, the radial profiles are, I don't know if I can go back to another slide, but um, well, a radial profile, um, in this case, what we were doing is mapping out the counts per pixel. So we were taking um, a, <laughs> what we were doing is taking um, these profiles. So we were selecting regions along the clearly defined rim of the remnant and basically profiling how much light fell in which pixels of that region. And then using the exact same region, placing it in the exact same place again for a uh, an observation a few years later to see. So it's, uh measure of count versus radius basically. Right? Yes, it's a measure of, yes, counts versus pixel value. Um, so it's showing where the rim, how much the rim is expanding over time. It's showing us basically the size of the, um, the drop in counts as you get to the edge of the remnant in different places around it. Um, yes, so here we were just using that um, to make sure that we measured it almost consistently around most edges of the remnant um, and found out whether there were any inconsistencies at different sides. Um, so for your second question, um, there are different types of emission on the north and the south. So the northern rim is like almost noticeably in the photos, a lot brighter than the southern rim. Um, and it's just because it's being produced by different kind of emission. So I think, yeah, one of the uh, earlier slides was talking about thermal emission on the northern side and the synchrotron emission produced by the southern side. I don't know exactly what the mechanism is that made that happen that way, um, but there's something about the way that the shock originally expanded when the supernova first went off that created these asymmetries. You can kind of see visually that it looks different in a bunch of different regions of it, and that actually contributes to the different velocities going outwards towards north and the south. So the details of how that came about, I'm not sure, but the top and the bottom um, are slightly different forms of emission, which contributes to their different velocity values. I was just wondering if the cyclotron emissions indicate a magnetic field, which indicates a kind of pulsar sitting there. Hmm. Uh, not that I know of. Um, there's sometimes pulsars at the centers of supernova remnants that we see now, but there's not one at the center of this one that we know about. Yes. Would you expect a pulsar at the center of a cyclone? No. Why not? Well, that's a good point. Type 1a supernova remnants are a white dwarf and something else in a binary or a white dwarf in itself orbiting around each other until one of them pulls enough mass off the other that it surpasses some limit that makes it explode. So you'd, you'd find the, the leftover white dwarf that was creating the initial explosion at the center there. That was a trick question. <laughs> uh, let's see, I got some other we have down here. We got lots of congratulations, Sadie. Good presentation. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it was Sadie Coffin that was in the chat that got the name. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Sadie. Thank you very much. Thank and congratulations. You. Give me a moment here to get my presentations all in order again. Uh, 
And I have Jamie up next. Let me load up Jamie's uh, presentation here. Give me a second. Of my, uh, my PowerPoint is being funky. And which one was yours, Jamie? Was it a, oh, it's a caustic form? Was it a PDF? Uh, yeah, it's a PDF file. Okay. I got too many things in there. So let's see. Here. Was it the uh, cosmic noise? Cosmic noon? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let me uh, this. Share that screen. And how do you pronounce your last name, Jamie? Uh, I'll let you say it. Yeah. Okay. So oh, right over here, yeah. Jamie. And uh, if you just click the uh, mouse, yeah, it should this. it should go through the screens for you. Or, or or use the wheel. Yeah, uh, I would test it. Use the wheel. You can move the wheel either way. Okay. Yeah. That, okay, that's nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me here. My name is. Uh, that's. Okay. Just move this. Yeah. Up. Okay. My name is Jitra Pond Lepasat Pong, and you can call me Jamie. I'm a first year PhD student studying at IIT and I'm working on a galaxy evolution research group at IIT right now. So my, my research will involve what I have been working on like for, for several months already. And my, so the topic that I will be presenting today will be about star formation and cosmic noon. So let's get start from here. I will show you the picture of some beautiful galaxies first. So we know that there are, there are two main types of galaxies, like spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. Other than that, if we talk about the color of galaxies, we know that most spiral galaxies are blue. They have blue color and elliptical galaxies, they, they look like orange or like yellow, but as to emerge, they, they will call them like red galaxies. So if you look at the, the spiral galaxies, we can see that like those blue galaxies, they are less massive. And if you look at like along the spiral arms, you can see that there are a lot of blue stars around here with, with like a lot of star formation. So we know that for blue galaxies, they have a lot of star formation going on there. While in the red galaxies, we don't see any new stars at all. And they are all, they are almost just like red stars or old stars. So we call that galaxies as the passive galaxies. So we have to talk about uh, what are the relation or the difference between these two types of galaxies. Of course, we know that these galaxies have different color and they have different structure as well. And the star formation rate will also be different because we know that like we have much more star formation in in spiral galaxies rather than the elliptical galaxies. And we can also relate the relation between these type of galaxies using the uh, life cycle or the evolution of galaxies. If you look at uh, the diagram like this, this is basically just like the life cycle of galaxies. We know that galaxies form from the, the collapse of dark matter halo. And after that, when the gas cloud collapses. Uh, stars start forming in galaxies and we will, there will be like more and more stars forming until it forms into spiral galaxies like this. In, in this type of galaxies, we can see that there are a lot of blue stars and like a lot of star formation going on right there. But after that, there are two main ways of, of like evolution that can go on after this. Uh, the one way that it can go is 
those galaxies can just keep producing stars until it runs out of gas and then it just stop forming stars. We call the process of the stopping of star formation as the quenching process. So these galaxies are quenched because they, they stop the star formation because they just run out of gas. And another way that the galaxies can evolve is if they merge with other type of, if, we, if they merge with other galaxies, uh, the spiral structure and like the disk will get destroyed and the gas will get driven out of galaxies and then it becomes like a spheroid structure like this called elliptical galaxies. So after the mergers, gas also get driven out of galaxies and there will be no more star formation as well. So the key things in the galaxy evolution is, it's all about star formation. Galaxy evolution is all about like how star forms in the galaxy and how those galaxies stop the star formation. So that's why star formation is like the key idea of galaxy evolution. And astronomers also have like some funny way to think about like star formation in the universe. They relate the star formation in the universe with the time of the day, as we can see right here. So this is like my question on where are we now on the cosmic time? After the Big Bang, we know that uh, after the Big Bang, after that, uh, when the universe starts cooling down, there's no star yet during that time. So we know that that time we, call, we can call it as dark age because there's like no stars at all until stars start forming in the galaxies. And we can call that as the cosmic dawn because it's like, just like the start of the time when universe start to get brighter and brighter. We call this period as the cosmic dawn. And after that, we have more and more stars in the universe until we can call that period as the cosmic noon, which is like the peak of stars formation. During this period, half of the stellar mass of the universe got produced during this time. So it's basically just like half of stars got created during the time of cosmic noon, which is around 10 billion years ago. And after that, uh, the star formation rate of the universe start to drop. And we have like some quenching process going on that make the, the star formation rate of the universe decline. And in the present day, we have a nickname as like the cosmic happy hour because during that time, it's just like, it's just like going to become evening soon and there will be like less and less stars forming in the universe and universe and all the old stars start to die after that. So the universe becomes like darker and darker again, but we don't have to worry about that that much because it will take like around a lot of like some several billion years for that to happen. So we don't have to worry about that that much. Now, as I said before, we have reached, we have already passed the cosmic noon. So the period of star formation, so the star formation rate starts to drop down. Uh, in the y-axis, this is the star formation rate of, of the universe. And we can see that uh, in this part, in the x-axis is called look back time or like the time that we look back to the beginning of the universe. And we can see that in the past, we have like more and more star formation going on until it reached the peak at around 10 billion years ago. And then after that, you can see that the star formation rate start to drop down again. So the question is what's going on during this period? Like why the star formation rate just stop like that? It's something that I mentioned before is the quenching process. And there are two main process that there are two main modes of quenching called internal, we have internal process and environmental process. Let's start from the internal process first. As I mentioned before, if we have, if we have star formation, star, we need some gas to create stars. And normally in galaxies, we always have like some gas inflow into the galaxy as like the supply to create stars. But we know that eventually all this gas can also run out as well. And when, when the gas run out, we know that like there will be like less and less star formation. We call this as cosmological starvation. A third process is that when we have uh, more stars and 
more gas in the galaxy, uh, the galaxy will become active and we have like the ATN outflow that can also drive the gas out of the galaxy as well. And when we have a lot of stars, like some stars start to explode as supernova and they just drive gas out of galaxy as well. So this is like the process that can occur. And uh, also another process is the mergers of galaxies. When, when the galaxies merge together, the structure got destroyed. And when there's no this, there will be no instability or like the process that creates stars will, will stop as well. And this process also remove gas out of galaxies. So that's why like there will be no more star formation. Now, about the external process or environmental effects. Uh, if you look at the image of something like a galaxy cluster, we can see that a lot of galaxies in the cluster, they are mostly like red galaxies. Most of the galaxies here, they have red color and they have like really small star formation layer. So we know that like in the dense environment, there has to be some process that stop star formation as well. And there will be some theory about how this occur, such as the lamp pressure stripping. So when, when galaxy pass through the intergalactic medium, sometimes gas can get driven out of the galaxy as well. As well as some uh, interaction between galaxies such as tidal stripping that can just like pull the gas and start off out of galaxy from the tidal force as well. So we know that this can be like another potential cause of quenching. So right now we, we will just tie into my research. So in my research, my research is all about trying to study the effect of environmental quenching. And in my research, I have to use a telescope at Keck Observatory, like 10 meter telescope in Hawaii and take spectra from extra galactic fields to measure the effect of environmental data. Yeah, but sadly that I could not go to Hawaii yet because of like COVID restriction. That's why when I did this research, I have to do the remote observing run and I have to connect to the telescope using internet and like communicate with telescope operator using Zoom call. So it's like a fun experience to do as well. And there's, there's a lot of observing runs that I participate in. Like uh, the most recent one was like this, uh, this Tuesday, actually it's like last Tuesday that I participated. And Sadie also participated in this observing run as well. And it was fun, but uh, last Tuesday that's like the weather, the weather was so bad that uh, we could not use the telescope at all. So we just stay up all night waiting for the for the weather to get better, but it's not it's not better at all, and we didn't get any data. <laughs> but that's okay. That's like one of the fun of being an astronomer. Like we never know what sky condition is going to be in any observations. So that's like a nice experience as well, and. <laughs> This research is still in progress. So I'm just the first year PhD student and I have just working on this, pro this research for several months. So there's still a lot to do, like such as some additional data reduction and the red shift extraction and study like the density map of galaxies using Polonoid tessellation method. So there's still a lot to do and I'm excited to do this as well. So the takeaway of my talk is we know that star formation rate is the star formation is like the integral part of galaxy evolution. And we also passed the peak of star formation right now. That's why like the star formation rate from now on will just keep decreasing. And right now there's like a lot of process that quench the star formation. And this is the field that still need a lot of study to fully understand it. So thank you so much for listening to my talk and uh, please feel free to ask me any question. Thank you. Jerry? Jamie, I said Jerry. Jamie. Oh, Jamie. Yeah. Questions online? Let me see. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Jerry, 
you know, repeat the question for the people online. Yeah. So the question is, uh, can I resolve the galaxies to see like individual stars inside the galaxies? The yeah, from the spectrum. Um, so we can only study uh, for those galaxies, they are really far away. So mostly we can just see only the total like combination of all stars together inside the galaxies. And so there's a lot of model to analyze those spectra to get like as much information as possible from just like the, the total spectrum from like all everything inside the galaxies combined together. So there's a lot of paper writing about that. And it's like a lot of complicated process to do that as well. Thank you. Yes. That, uh, you're talking about uh, gas inflows and outflows? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned there is a <coughs> nuclei that can be pulling gas out of a system. Yeah. And there could be supernovas that are pushing the gas out of the system. Yeah. Now, can you, and there's different inflow mechanisms. Can you, is there some way to tell which one is dominant? Or is it strictly ba based on star formation rate? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. So the question is, uh, when I mentioned the, uh, let's see, I think I cannot back a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when, when I mentioned that there are a lot of internal effects that can, uh, the question is that like, can these internal effects, like can we know which one is dominant or not like, uh, in this question, uh, I'm still not sure about like the answer. I I think there should be some way to to know about like maybe the AGN activities. Like at least we can measure the AGN activities inside the galaxy. And if if we have like a lot of AGN activities, we can that can imply that AGN might be dominated. But in this field, there's a lot of of study about it, and I think the theory is still not complete so there's still like a lot of research going on so maybe i cannot give like the full answer to this question but yeah this an interesting question yes you showed a picture of the keck telescope with yeah. laser beams shooting out of it yeah is that <laughs> supposed to shoot down those stupid satellites <laughs> <laughs> okay so when i observe using keck telescope i i'm sure that we are not doing this one but Actually, this is like a special technique that we that astronomers use to to reduce the effect of the atmosphere. We call it as adaptive optics, and that op that technique we just use the laser to shoot into the sky to create artificial stars, so that we can map the properties of atmosphere before we observe we, we, before we observe stars. Using this technique, we can reduce the uh, the effect of atmosphere that can interfere with the data by a lot. And I'm sure that when I when I did the observing run, I, I don't think we did this process, but yeah, this is like one of the technique for like large telescope, like K telescope. I have a question for you. Yes. You talked about going from cosmic dawn to cosmic noon. Yeah. The cosmic happy hour. Yeah. What comes next? Um, yeah, it's just that's interesting. Like maybe we can call it like cosmic dust or maybe cosmic night, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. We don't know. It, it, it's yeah, a, it's right. just a it's all speculative yeah. at this point. Right, yeah. right. Any other questions for Jamie? Well, thank you very much, Jamie. Yeah. Thank it. you. All righty. Let me switch off our presentations here. Who did I have up next? Jamie, uh, Bill Schlein says to you, he's online, says, if you run into uh, Josh Wallowender at Tech, tell him Stellar View Bill says hi. That should get you a free cup of coffee if you're into coffee. Yeah. Uh, another question, where does the name RAM pressure stripping originate from? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, is that one of the terms that they use? So I think it's just like the gas just, the galaxy just ram into the inner 
intragalactic medium and then uh, the gas starts to get like cool. So it's it's RAM like and running that. into meaning yeah, RAM. Okay. Okay. All right, let me see here. Um, Second here. And so our next talk is from Ben Vaughn. All right. You are all set, Ben. All right. You can use the, the, the scroll or the uh, left click button to move yourself oh, through. <laughs> just to, if you yeah, hang on. Hang on. All right, just, I'm done. Just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So just use the, uh, if you just want to advance, just use the left button to click and you get the scroll backwards if you want to back up. Okay. Thanks, Ben. All right. Can you guys hear me in the back? Great. It's, so, um, yeah, so my talk here is uh, a little different from the others in that we built something as opposed to like theory or analyzing data. So um, our project is called the Tomographic Ionized Carbon Mapping Experiment. And we are all very excited because we just finished our commissioning run out at Kitt Peak. Yes. So I have here um, a screenshot of us. Um, this is not the whole collaboration, but it, uh some of the key people um where we were on a remote observing run and in the background there's um some things here like this is the readout from one of the detectors and some pointing for the telescope um yeah and i guess some key people to point out are here's me obviously and then there's uh, my phd or my uh, thesis advisor mike zemkov and dr abigail kreitz who's the principal investigator for the whole project and then, um, sadly, not everyone in the collaboration could be shown there. So here's the rest of us and all of our uh, institutions that we're part of. So it's a mid-sized collaboration. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about what this instrument <laughs> actually is. And so what it is is a cryostat where the optics for this are this spectrometer that has detectors on the edge here. And the rest of this is all about cooling it down to less than one Kelvin. So these stages here are different um, temperature stages. So here we have like a 50 Kelvin or a 50 Kelvin stage and then a 10 Kelvin stage and then a four Kelvin stage. And then here, everything's below one Kelvin. Um, and the reason we break up, we break it up into different stages is we have different physical processes that govern how to actually cool it down that far. Um, this thing here is a collimating lens. And so what happens when we observe is the light comes in here and it gets focused and then it goes into the spectrometer. Here. here is the actual live picture of the full cross head. And here's Dr. Kreitz in front of it. Um, so we can see kind of here are um, where the, the spectrometers are housed. They're not currently in this photo and then the different stages. So typically, it would not be open like this. It's in a huge concealed tin of aluminum. Going into what the actual spectrometers do. So here are a bunch of feed horns and we have feed horns here because we're actually observing the radio. And so the light comes in this way, which would be here on this diagram and it bounces off the edge here where there's a diffraction grating that splits the light kind of like how a prism would split, split optical light. And it bounces back to this edge of the spectrometer that is populated with a bunch of detectors. So it's not populated right now, but this is what the detectors look like. So each of these small little uh, 
rectangles here are pixels. And the way this detector works is it's a bolometer. So what it does is it measures a change in heat from light hitting it. And we can uh, calibrate that change in heat to what an actual amount of light would look like. So one way we would do this is point it at like a known object like Jupiter and say, okay, this is how much light we get from Jupiter and this is how much the heat changed. And just use that as a conversion factor. Um, we actually use a lot of other uh, objects too, like quasars, for example, they're bright and point sourcey. So, and the luminosity or the, the light coming from them is well, well known. So, they make for good calibrators. Um, and here's a, so here's just a close up on the detectors. So, all of these wires you see here are the thermometry. And so, one annoying thing about having things below one Kelvin is they have to be really cold. But what happens when you have electricity running through something? It generates heat. And so all of these wires and um, thermometer readouts are very specially designed to take the least amount of current possible to run so that it generates the least amount of heat. And so the end result is you get this huge mess of stuff. But all of these wires are basically just um, reading out the, the temperature on the bolometer and just putting that to a computer. And so I have a bunch of different views. So this is a face down view of all the detectors and side view. Here's the feed ones for reference. So what we do to actually observe is we put it at the end of the peak 12 meter radio telescope. And I actually flew out there uh, this winter to help facilitate that. And so, um, one thing I wanted to point out in these pictures is in the radio telescope, there's a little cabin here. And that little cabin is where we put our big grass at. And so getting it in there is a doozy. Um, we have to first crane it over this little wall here and then put it down. And then you can kind of see it in this picture. There's like a winch here on the telescope itself. And so we then attach it to that winch and then pull it up. And this whole thing weighs, I don't know, like some amount of tons. It's pretty darn heavy. So it's a it's a full day thing to print it in. Um, but once we do that, it's in. Um, so here's a picture of it inside the cabin. This is the press set. Um, and one thing you might notice immediately is that it doesn't look like it moves. And that's because it doesn't. So the light from the radio telescope, from the 12 meter dish, comes in through here. And these red um, lines trace the ray path for the light. So what happens is it bounces off of these mirrors all the way up into the cryostat. So we don't have to move our huge chunk of metal. We just have to move the bigger chunk of metal to the radio telescope to point at different spots in the sky. Um, but there's a problem with that, which is as you move the telescope horizontally and you move it vertically, the angle at which this light comes in can change. And so this big blue thing here is actually motorized and it's motorized to move left and right to catch the light as the angle it comes in changes and it gives us better pointing for our instrument. But there's a lot of complications there. I mean, it's a real easy. So, What's the point of going through all of that pain? Um, and the point is we get these spatial, spatially resolved and spectrally resolved maps. So disclaimer here, it's a commissioning run. Not all the detectors are populated. Some of them are test detectors. So there's, that's why some of these don't look so good, right? I mean, this one here, for example, that's just noise. And this one is off, but the point here is that we get these spatial maps and you can see labeled here the different um, frequencies of light we're looking at. And so this image here particularly is the uh, galactic center. And so, yeah, that's the point of going through all of this pain of cooling this thing down to sub one Kelvin, lifting it up, having this weird nebulous K-mirror thing that moves around to catch the light is we get these really 
really nice maps and there's a lot of stuff we can do with that. So that's all. Does this frequency stack up together and make sure it is right mm -hmm. reading? Yeah. Um, like a photo or some kind of frequency? He's asking if you stack up those images together at a higher stack. resolution. Oh. Um, so all the frequency, I noticed that. Yeah. It's like you can put the layer that comes on. Is that correct? So the question is can you, um, if I go back to this image? So I'm the talking about the frequency that I talked about when you stack it, then you may have find something. Yeah, so that is actually something. Uh, it's not, I don't think so. The question is can you stack these images and find something from that? Um, and or, or, or can you stack it and also test the pointing of the different bands, right? So, yeah, you could reasonably stack them to see if you're pointing at the same thing because some of the features would be the same but because it's different spectral bins there's going to be differences there um there are things you can do like if you actually plotted it as a spectra in different pixels you can like fit for a you can have a power law for what it for what the spectra would look like, and you can fit the exponential component of that, and then you could make a map of that if you wanted to stack them. And I hope in this near future, you guys got all the wiring in there. Maybe you might come up with the microchips. Never know. Hopefully. Ted? Uh, so this is in the millimeter wave band, in the far infrared. I yeah. mentioned that there's a feed horn that's feeding this into a, some sort of uh, diffraction uh, system that yeah. goes out. So what does the feed horn look like? I'm curious. It's, it's sort of a... So this is the, these are the feed horns right here. So they're spherical tapered feed horns? Yeah. So the question is, what do the feed horns look like? Title mentioned tomography, right? Yeah, so the so I, that implies a line integral to be somewhere. And I didn't see that. Yes, so the question was the title of this talk has tomography in it. Where is the tomography? Um, so the main science goal with this instrument is not to look at pretty images of the galactic center, it's to map ionized carbon throughout the whole sky basically it's a scan one of the nice things oh. is it's a scanning thing so you can get huge chunks of the sky and as you map carbon there's going to be different red shifted carbon lines in different areas of the sky and so the idea is if you can correlate where this red shifted line for carbon is with some other element like uh, the rotational lines of carbon monoxide, then you can get the redshift of that and you can make cuts where you have maps at different distances. So redshift, um, sorry, I didn't say this, but redshift is kind of a proxy for distance in astronomy. Could you show us the the redshift that you have in that Yes. Um, it looks as if, if a little uh, scurrying desert creature crawled into the dome the light goes right above the floor in its last horizontal path. Could like a, a rat or a bunny rabbit block all the light before it gets into your device? Oh, jack rat. Jack <laughs> they, so the question is, could a small animal block the light because this beam here is near the floor? Yeah. I suppose it could, but the telescope cabin closes and it, it's pretty, pretty sealed off when it closes. So nothing can get in. It'd have to get in like when people were working on it. That's how rats get in though. That's <laughs> All the way back. So what, was the, what was the technique by which you achieved some, uh, some one Kelvin uh, tool? So there's a- It looks like it's protected from the environment. Um, well, so when it's actually cold, it's sealed off in this huge, 
like metal casing. So, so the question is, how do you get it to one Kelvin? And it, and as a comment, it doesn't look like it's protected from the environment. So this, um, I forget what the name of this material is, but the point is, it's it's not thermally conductive. It's an insulator. And so all of the different stages are wrapped up in this. And so that insulates it from the environment. And that's what helps keep it cold. How do we get it to one Kelvin? That's admittedly something that I'm supposed to learn this summer. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea, I think, is um, you have these different stages that use different physical processes to go lower and lower. So liquid nitrogen. For example, it goes down to like 77 Kelvin, not 4 Kelvin. Um, so to jump from 77 Kelvin to 4 Kelvin, what we actually use is liquid helium. So um, basically, this fridge pumps liquid helium throughout, and that cools it down. Liquid helium is 4 Kelvin. How do you do? How do you do the longer Kelvin? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You'll have to come back next I'll year. I'll have to come back next year <laughs> once I've, once I've uh, learned. Frank, you had a question? Yeah, I was just kind of concluding. This isn't an imaging instrument so much as a survey instrument. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a survey instrument. Because it, it's, it's designed to look at sky and just let sky go by. And, and... Yeah. Good, good, good point. So what's the, uh, what's the wavelength range of uh, the instrument? Well, it's about 183 gigahertz to, is that 320? Okay. Any other questions? Let me see if you got any online here. Oh, yeah. Where am I going? I'm going over this way. All right. That's what messages. Uh, Somebody asked the same question. What's the wavelength range? What is is the time an acronym? Yes, time is an acronym. Yes. So the beginning of the title page. Clearly. Time means tomographic ionized carbon mapping experiment. Thanks for letting us online. How long does it take to take a spectrum? Uh, well, for each position, it sits there for about five seconds. Five seconds. Oh, wow. Well, pretty quick. So the telescope actually tracks the sky for five seconds, then jumps? Yeah, so it, so it does have some. Yeah. I'm so confused. <laughs> no. Yes? How does it get enough signal in five seconds? Because the detectors are incredibly sensitive. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I have one presentation left. So this must be Sophia's. All right. So you can either click the mouse or roll with the. Uh, gotcha. Uh, okay. Thanks, Sophia. Question Have you ever? Look at the radio observation of the pulsar, being like, man, I can totally detect a, a gravitational wave using this. Me neither. <laughs> but hopefully, and thankfully enough, scientists are really, really smart. And somebody came with this idea. And because of that, now one of the most promising techniques for detecting gravitational waves is using these dead stars known as pulsars. And, and the results are looking extremely promising. Thanks everyone for coming to this talk titled Hunting Gravitational Waves Using Pulsars. Um, 
My name is Sofia Sosa, and in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to try to convince you that wait, pulsars are among the coolest objects in the universe. Everyone who's anyone in the astronomical community is like, yay, black holes, dark matter, galaxies. But here in the pulsar team, we can do something that they cannot. We can use pulsars to detect gravitation waves. Can black holes do that? They cannot. Sorry, Brian, I'm chilling. <laughs> And before we start, let me ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with the LIGO Observatory and the first detection of a gravitational wave back in the Awesome, amazing. Well, as you may know, the detection of gravitational waves is a field of research that gained a lot of attention over the past 50 years or so. And, and as of now, we have several in earth base in gravitational wave observatory which are specifically engineered to detect short period gravitational waves, like LIGO in that image. And that is what gravitational waves with periods of milliseconds in the case of LIGO, or maybe a month in the case of LISA. And so far, the detectors have been doing a pretty darn amazing job. They are extremely sensitive. And thanks to them, in 2016, we had the first ever detection of a gravitational wave, which was really cool because it confirmed theoretical predictions and like a hundred years ago by Einstein. So that was amazing. And however, this is not a full story because just as the photons of the electromagnetic spectrum have like a very large range of wavelength, so does the spectrum of gravitational waves. And these Earth-based detectors are basically and blind to this whole other side of the spectrum consisting of long period gravitational waves, which are usually produced by more massive objects, such as a binary system of neutron stars or a merger of black holes, which are really interesting events. But so if we want to detect those long period gravitational waves, we can no longer rely on these small toys like Lisa and Lego. No, <laughs> the, the, these are petty, they did it for noobs. We want like some real actual large scale gravitational wave detectors, the size of the whole Milky Way even. And that's when pulsars come to save the day. Okay, I know that everyone sitting here must be like very well versed in compact objects and you didn't know introduction to pulsars, but just for the sake of it, let me refresh your memory. Pulsars are a type of neutron stars. So basically they are um, compact objects that are formed after a very massive star undergoes a supernova collapse, and they leave behind a supernova remnant, as Sadie has already visually explained in her presentation. Thank you, Sadie. In the process, a mass of like one and a half times the mass of our sun is condensed, is um, contracted into a sphere of about 10 kilometers in diameter, in diameter, which is about the size of Rochester City. So they are extremely dense objects. And moreover, <laughs> the conservation of angular momentum and magnetic field leads this object to, indeed into the development of extremely high rotational speed and also extremely strong magnetic fields. So as a result, we have like this super compact, super dense object, super incredibly dense like magnets spinning in the sky at literally thousands of revolutions per second. That's how fast they are. Oh, and fun fact, they were, this is supposed to be made. They were actually discovered by Joseph Bell and back in the 70s, who was a grad student. And this discovery actually led to, um, to winning a Nobel Prize, but it wasn't received by her because she was a woman and a grand student. What was her name? Joseline Bell. She's still alive, she's really cool. So just for comparison, this is what a pulsar or neutron star would look like if it was placed like next to Manhattan. Although it's hard to believe, just in that sphere, which is like 10 kilometers in diameter, we have one and a half times the mass of our sun. So one and a half times the sun compressed in a sphere the size of Manhattan. That's whole. They're, they're, they're not black holes, but they're like pretty close, basically. Um, so pulsars are like a background for physicists because they let us study a huge variety of physical phenomena from the very large like doing cosmology and testing the theories of general relativity to the very small, like for example, in studying the acceleration of relativistic particles or studying how matter behaves when it's compressed to really high densities. However, 
what we're going to do now and what is my field of research is using pulsars to detect gravitational waves. And pulsars are ideal detectors of gravitational waves for two reasons. In the first place, they have like in this and huge radio beams emanating from, from the magnetic poles, mainly in radio, gamma rays, and X rays. And moreover, since the rotation axis is not usually aligned with this and with the magnetic axis, this beam is rotating, is spinning, is processing around the rotation axis. So we will only see one pulse of radiation once per and per period when the beam swipes through our visual, just like a lighthouse. So in fact, this model is called the lighthouse model because the pulsar basically behaves like a galactic lighthouse. And secondly, because of their very high velocities and their very large um, angular momentum, the period of the pulsar and therefore the spacing between two consecutive pulses is extremely regular. In that sense, pulsars behave like celestial clocks. In fact, some pulsars are even more precise than some of the most advanced atomic clocks here on Earth. So they are really, really precise. Now, if we have a good antenna here on Earth, I am not in a problem with presentation. If we have a good antenna here on Earth, we, um, we will be able to measure when each of the pulses arrive, uh, sorry, each of the pulses arrive. So we can measure the time of arrival of each of the pulses. We can be like, oh, one arrive at one, the next at one and 10 minutes, the next one and 20 minutes or whatever. That's something that we can observe using radio antennas. On the other hand, if we have some physical model describing the propagation of the pulses between the pulse and us, we can try to make predictions of when each of the pulses is going to arrive. And then we, try to we can try to compare our observations with our predictions. However, predicting those times of arrival is extremely very difficult. And because the pulses are affected by a variety of phenomena. For example, the interstellar medium is going to disperse the pulses and pulses with lower frequency are going to arrive later than pulses with higher frequencies. So we have to take that into account when making our predictions. In, in a similar fashion, if a pulsar is part of a binary system, then the pulses are going to be Doppler shifted towards shorter periods when the pulsar when the pulsar is moving towards us, and they're going to be Doppler shifted towards longer periods when the pulsar is moving away. So all those effects and more have to be taken into account if we want to try to make predictions for the times of arrivals of the pulses. And the collection of all these physical phenomena and uh, leads to um, oh sorry if you have a basic understanding of each of these phenomena we can try to reduce them to their most fundamental ma mathematical equations and describe them using just a small set of parameters. And the collection of all these effects results in an extremely intricate <laughs> mathematical way, don't worry, I'm not a uh, mathematical model, don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, which is called a timing model. If this model was totally correct, no mistakes, we know everything that there is to know about the pulses and how they come to us, then we will be able to predict exactly the time of arrival of each of the pulses. Great. But what usually happens is that we observe like a deviation between our predictions and the observations. And when that happens, we can attribute this difference to some model that is not taken into account or that is not, sorry, is attributed to some effect that is not being taken into account or that is not being correctly modeled in our parameters. Maybe we forgot to take into account that the pulsar is moving. Maybe we are considering that the interstellar medium is more dense than it actually is. So our objective then is to tweak the parameters of our model in order to um, make our predictions match our observations. And when we are, and if we are able to do that, this new set of optimized parameters is gonna give us like actual really important physical information about the and underlying phenomena affecting the pulses. We will be able to measure how fast the pulse is moving, how dense is the interstellar medium, or even the passing of a gravitational wave. This process of fine-tuning the parameters in order to make our predictions match the observations is what is usually called pulsar timing. Okay, so as I mentioned, one of the many physical effects that can affect the propagation of the pulses or coming from a pulsar are precisely gravitational waves. 
In a nutshell, gravitational waves are perturbations to the curvature of space-time that are generated by asymmetrical movement of bodies, especially very massive um, bodies, like a binary system of two neutron stars or maybe two black holes, or even an, a rotating neutron star that is not totally asymmetric, but that might have... But a neutron star that might have like, like a bump on one of the sides and it's rotating, that will also generate gravitational waves. Now, what's really interesting about gravitational waves is the effect that they have on bodies. Like, for example, let's imagine that we have like a pond with waves and we drop a particle. So we can expect that, the, that because of the waves, the particle is going to move up and down, right? Well, gravitational waves behave differently from, and from mechanical waves, such as this one. If we have a particle that is at rest in the system, and we introduce a gravitational wave, the particle is not going to move. It's going to stay at rest. However, its distance to other particles is going to start to oscillate by a very small amount. And it will create patterns like in these two figures. So if there was a gravitational wave passing between me and Sadie, for example, we will both still be at rest. I, I wouldn't start moving back and forth. But the distance between us will oscillate. Yeah, I know this doesn't really anti-intuitive. How can the distance change if I'm still at rest? But that's one of the consequences of general relativity. Okay, now let's imagine for a second that one of these particles is the Earth and the other one is a pulsar. And we have a gravitational wave traveling between them. As I mentioned, the gravitational wave is going to change the distance between the Earth and the pulsar. So the pulses coming from the pulsar are going to arrive either earlier or later because they have a different distance to travel that from what we, what we would expect if there were no gravitational waves. And as I mentioned before, this offset between what I was expecting and what I observed is going to introduce um, a deviation in our observations when we compare them to the predictions. And like, for example, in this figure, and that is something that we can measure. We will be measuring the effect of a gravitational wave just by observing the pulses coming from the pulsar. Now, supposing that we uh, observe something like this in our observation, how can we be sure that this came, that this was produced by a gravitational wave and not by some other effect because it's really difficult to uh, tell apart gravitational waves from other things? Well, um, what we can do is observe many, many pulses at the time because if a gravitational wave is propagating through the galaxy, then it is going to affect the observation from many pulses at once. So we should uh, observe observe this kind of pattern being correlated in the observations of many pulsars. Then and only then we can be sure that what we observe is indeed a gravitational wave and we can pop the champagne that we have waiting in the fridge. Therefore, if we want to observe gravitational waves, we need to observe several pulsars in order to compare and analyze, and analyze their correlations. And to this end, there are huge international projects known as pulsar timing arrays, which are basically like sets of pulsars that are being monitored by radio antennas all over the world. In particular, and there are three of these big projects that which are currently working. We have the European pulsar timing array, obviously in Europe. We have the Parks pulsar timing array in Australia and, and the Nanograph collaboration in North America, which actually has some of its members working right here at the RIT. So the idea basically is to combine observations from all these three antennas all over the world, share our data, share our results, compare them. And if and if at some point somebody working in a radio antenna in Australia says, hey, I detected a gravitational wave, or somebody in Europe says, says, hey, me too, and somebody in North America says, no way, I, I, I found it too, then we will be like, yes, we detected a gravitational waves, a wave using pulsars. So what we like to do in the future is, first of all, keep on observing and as many pulses as we can, we want to upgrade our antennas. We, got, we want to get as much precision as we, as, as we can because, and I cannot emphasize this enough, gravitational waves are extremely, extremely weak, extremely hard to detect. But the, the, the results so far are looking extremely promising and our sensitivity is getting closer and closer to what we would expect for a gravitational wave. So hopefully, maybe in the next decade or so, we will be able to detect our first long period gravitational wave using pulsars.
Thank you. And any questions from anyone who is not Richmond Sensei? <laughs> Yes, Jamie. That one slide that you show the application of Salter on different field of astronomy, and that slide also that slide also uh, mentioned the application on planetary science and cosmology. So yeah. I would like to know uh, what the application on planetary science and cosmology is for Salter. Well, and the presentation I mentioned that when we create these mathematical models to try to make predictions for the times of arrival, we have to take into account many effects. One of these effects is, for example, the movement of the Earth in its orbit, right? Because the pulse, the pulse coming from a pulsar is going to take longer to reach us if we are on the other side of the sun or if we are closer. So by measuring how the movement of the Earth on its orbit affects and the times of arrival, we can make estimations on how big is the orbit of the air, how fast the air is moving, etc. We also have to take into account things such as the deviation of light around the sun, because even though it's extremely, extremely weak, when at this level of position, we must take into account so we can also get information about the sun. And we can also take into account, like, for example, the influence of Jupiter on the times of arrival. So once again, we will get information on Jupiter. And thankfully enough, when the um, data from the sun, earth, and Jupiter is very well studied, so we don't need to tweak those parameters in particular. But if we wanted to, we could get information about our own solar system just by studying pulsars. Because, of course, the earth is not isolated it's in between a system. So we have to take into account whichever effect the solar system might have on the times of arrival of the pulses. Make sense? Thank you. All the way back. I have a quick question now. And the idea would be, of course, to, in the best case scenario, what we would like to do is to observe an gravitational wave coming from a merger of black holes, as you mentioned. And, yeah, and, and as soon as we do that, we would like to tell our, I am, Optic as in as astronomer friends, like, hey, I will say this. Can you point your telescope to that part of the sky and maybe you try to find whichever Marshal produces? Well, what, and, I don't, to be perfectly honest, I don't know the exact number, but yeah, it would, I mean, they're both moving at the speed of light, additional ways and optical light. Maybe the light will be slightly slower because of the interstellar medium, but. You, I wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like months, it would be probably be like days, hours. Sorry, can you repeat the question? He's talking well, about looking at the historical data. Yeah. Well, and two things. The question was, if I got it correctly, if we have analyzed data from pulsar that are close to gravitational resources. Right. At that yeah. time. At that time. That yeah. The two things to take into account. First one, because of how, how gravitational waves behave, we get our highest sensitivity, not when the pulsar is in the direction of the gravitational wave, but when they are at 45 degrees or so. So we want pulsars that are perpendicular to the source of the gravitational waves because that's when we get like the highest like um, oscillation of time space. And secondly, and the only known gravitational wave sources today are those that were detected by LIGO and Virgo. And they only detect short period gravitational waves. So even though we, we know the location of resources, we wouldn't be able to observe them using pulsars because pulsars only detect long period gravitational waves. Are these periods of uh, release in fact for any concern with the gravitational wave uh, for, uh, for our planet? 
So the question is, if there is any concern about the graviton wave? Gravity wave, well, asking, gravitational what? waves. Oh, gravitational waves. Oh, if, if, if we should be concerned about them for our planet. Now, um, they are totally harmless. Like we would, the, uh, if you watch like a Star Trek Discovery, and at some point they are like, oh no, we were hit by a gravitational wave, our ship is being destroyed. That's, oh, no, that, 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 that will never happen. Yeah. Uh, you're saying uh, might back some kind of uh, uh, straight waves or something, single loss, something like that. And for all intents and purposes, for our practical life, we it will have like n the passing of station waves. In fact, they are passing through us all the time. And they have no effect whatsoever on our lives. In fact, the reason why we need to build these huge detectors is because we, re we, need, we need to achieve really, really high precision to detect them. So it will affect us here on Earth if you, for some reason, want to have like a very, very stable laser. But for all, all the intents and purposes, it, we shouldn't be concerned about them. They're hard to detect. Okay. Yeah. Frank, you had a question? Mm -hmm. I was wondering, since these are timing arrays, was, was the instrument a little bit of accuracy? And how does that affect your ability to measure? What is the instrument? What? Sorry. What, what's the shortest period of time you can measure? How good, you, how good are the blocks? Yeah. So the question is what is the shortest period of time that we can detect? Um, the shortest we can detect is about a few months, maybe six months, if we go to really, really high precision and the longest would be like a couple of years and after that we lose sensitivity again so it's so, before you think coming in where you got to observe forever in order to get that precision mm, not forever but we need to observe at least for a span of but the a few window, months the more precision yeah basically so yeah. what we want to do is integrate over time and get as many years decades if possible, of observations. Well, I was just wondering if, it, if, it, if there was a limitation between how well you could measure time and what size of, of uh, gravitational wave you might be able to detect. Yeah, definitely. Just as there's a relation between the size of, of the LIGO and, and the space based uh, in a rocket. So the question is is there is any limitation if the, the limitations on, on measuring time will change our precision, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely. Because it's not enough just having a, like a huge radio antenna. You also need to have like a really, really precise clock to say, oh yeah, this way you arrive at exactly two seconds, five minutes, milliseconds, whatever. And that's why in most of these observatories, they use atomic clocks. They have atomic clocks that are connected to the antenna. So when, whenever each of the pulses arrive, you use the atomic clock to leave like a, what we call a timestamp for each of the pulses. So in order to get really high precision and really good observations, you need well, a great telescope, long integration times, and also a really, really good clock. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got a couple of questions online. Um, Tony asks, has the collapse of the Arecibo negatively affected your research? If so, is there any in the works to replace it or otherwise fill that gap? It doesn't affect my research in particular because I don't use observations from Arecibo. I use observations from the ARC. Well, this should be shown. How we present this? Uh, it's pretty... Oh, I got an idea. Can you present this? I messed you up here. <laughs> we'll call it here. Oh, no one. Yeah, Come here. yeah. We I don't use observations from RC, I use observations from the Argentine Institute of High Astronomy, which is a newly and refurbished observatory in near Buenos Aires, which has two 30 meter, meter dish antennas. And so the good thing about these this antennas is that first we don't need to compete against other scientists to use them because they are basic, we have basically full availability. We have them, they're, they're like our own toys, they're just for ourselves. And also, they are in the southern hemisphere, so we can observe pulsars that people from the northern hemisphere cannot observe. So, while the loss of RCO is obviously huge, 
just for the whole astronomical community. And it doesn't affect my research in particular. In fact, I believe that some of the hardware that was part of the CRCO telescope was donated to our antennas. So in that sense, we even, we even benefited from the fact that RSC was for the part. And they were for free. That's awesome. Um, Jeff asks, is the correlated noise associated with effects on multiple pulsars from a single gravitational wave of it? Mm -hmm. This is a question. Yeah. Is the correlated noise associated with the effects on multiple pulsars from a single gravitational wave of it? Is the correct noise associated with the effects on multiple pulsars? And when we have said multiple pulsars that present a signal coming from the same gravitational wave, we do observe a correlated signal. That is not a type of noise. A noise would be something that is produced by our instruments or maybe in the background that we are observing. So we do need and to observe a correlated signal you know, to make sure that we are detecting is in a gravitational way. There is, however, correlated noise. And as you mentioned, and that needs to be taken into account in, an, in an our calculations. In fact, if we go back in... I don't know why that's not moving now. It's stuck. Yes. Let's move, move your cursor to the left. Okay. Move to the right. Okay, make sure you scroll through here. Okay. Tell me when. And go back, 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 back. Before this. Okay. Yeah, one more back. There. In fact, some of them, one of the things that we have to <laughs> take into account when making our predictions, as you can see in this last item, is correct the noise. So yeah, we, we take that into account. Answer your question, Jeff. So, how massive are the objects that you're going to measure with pulsars? How? Well, um, the cool thing about pulsars is that the gravitational, the level of gravitational waves that they allow us to observe are the longest periods one, which are in turn produced by some of the heaviest objects. So, we are talking about supermassive black hole measures, maybe like. Eight or more times the mass of a sun. In some cases, even like twenty mass, twenty times okay. the mass of a sun. So like eight to twenty masses, solar masses. Yeah, not not millions of solar masses, but I don't think there's such a thing as a black hole with a million. Solar I know. Masses. I'm just I'm just you know, extrapolating. Really interesting. Yeah. But so eight to twenty solar masses. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Back there. Any more questions online? Michael. <laughs> I don't want to ask you any questions. Oh, <laughs> I didn't want your questions anyway. She doesn't want Michael's questions. Michael doesn't want to ask her any questions. This is like a standoff. Um, have you looked at any magnetar pulsars? Yes. And in fact, that's the next step of our research. Magnetars um, are basically these pulsars that have like extra strong magnetic fields. In fact, in a fun fact is that if a, if a magnetar was to close, well, was to move close to the solar system, the, the magnetic field would be so strong that it would erase all the information in, in our credit cards. So that's how strong they are. And they are really interesting because they are suspected to be the sources of something that are, are, are called fast radio bursts, which are like spontaneous and really mysterious bursts of radio coming from random places in the sky. Nobody really knows where they come from, but it is speculated that maybe they come from magnetars which have like solar flares, but which are extremely amplified because of these magnetic fields. So yeah, one of our next steps in our research is observing magnetars and trying to confirm if FRBs, fast radio bursts, actually come from magnetars. Interesting, interesting. Any other questions? Online? Awesome. Well, thank you very much, so I appreciate it. I want to thank everybody tonight for Sophie, uh, Jamie, Ben, and Sadie. Thank you all for coming and sharing, sharing your work with us. You guys did a fantastic job. Thank you, Dr. Richmond, for bringing us these fantastic students. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, that's our meeting for tonight. Uh, any questions from, uh, from the folks online?
are in the house. Our next uh, events we have, uh, well, we're scheduled to do some observing tomorrow. If, you, if you're able to observe tomorrow, good luck. It doesn't look really promising, but there is an open house on Sunday from noon to three. I don't think I had it in my presentation. Noon to three at the Ferris Center. You guys are welcome to join us. We're out in Ionia. If you look at our website, rochesterastronomy.org, you can see where we're at. And that's, uh, that's, tomorrow, that's Sunday from noon to three. So welcome to have you guys join us there. That's our meeting. Without any further ado, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for coming to our April meeting. Good night.